So I'm going to do a talk on um, Einstein analytics. I've called the genius dashboard. Um, it is a dry run from London Calling. So yeah, um, hopefully, you know, if you're there, you can come again if you want to or see something else. Anyway, so who am I? Uh, my name is Ricky Hovgaard, and I am a consultant from uh, Make Positive. I've been working with um, I, or with Salesforce for six years, and um, as I said, currently work as a as a consultant. Um, I started using Salesforce or working with with core Salesforce uh, six years ago, and uh, since then ventured into other areas like marketing automation and um, Einstein <coughs> analytics. Um, so when I started with Salesforce, I actually spent a lot of my time building reports and, and dashboards for you know, the customers I was working with. But I also spent a lot of time teaching people how to do this. So when Einstein Analytics was uh, introduced, what, two and a half years ago, um, I jumped on the opportunity to, uh, to work with it. And um, I've since then helped uh, other companies get ramped up on uh, Einstein Analytics. So I kind of want to share my ex uh, experiences with you today and hopefully help you get a head start on creating some, some good dashboards. So first of all, what is Einstein Analytics? Um, some of you might have heard Wave Analytics before. Uh, it's basically the same thing. Uh, it was rebranded in, I think, six months ago. Um, so it's Salesforce's advanced reporting tool, or should I call say platform actually because you can do a lot more than you can do in operational reporting. So it's an add-on to your core sales and service cloud um, and it allows you to bring in Salesforce data as well as third-party data um, and slice and dice your data on the fly. And I actually want to say that it's a little bit more than just a dashboard. It's actually an analytics app where, which allows you to really explore your data um, easily. So when I started out with Einstein Analytics two and a half years ago, my dashboards were not very well thought through. So this is actually taken from the um, training session I attended two and a half years ago. And um, as you can see, it's not, you know, it doesn't have a clear <coughs> intention. It doesn't really tell a story. Uh, today, I'm doing it a little bit differently. So hopefully you can see that um, it's a little bit more structured. And what I try to do is actually guide my, my users to get a, a story out of the data. So in my two and a half years with Einstein Analytics, and even if you say the six years, I've I tried quite a lot of different things. I tried to you know, switch off the graphs, um, try to uh, change you know, fonts using different selection options. Um, I've even modified the JSON and SAC, which kind of uh, see how you can make a good dashboard. And um, so I want to take my learnings and, and, and share them with you here today. Because I think I've kind of, at least I found my way. So we can always uh, discuss if, if it's the best way. So um, as I said, uh, my intention is to kind of give my best practice in terms of designing some, some user-friendly uh, dashboards. And hopefully you can, t you can take those and uh, create your own user-friendly and highly interactive dashboards. Uh, I believe this is possible with three principles. So the first one is um, target your dashboard to your audience. The second one is understand what answers are being um, sought in your, your dashboards. And the final one is to calculate and compare numbers without using any code. <coughs> so the last one is a little bit of a lie, because today I'm going to show you a little trick that allows you to go into the code. but very easy um, and actually see how you can, you can uh, let the engine do all the work for you. Um, so I'm going to go into each one of these in more detail. I will be using a dashboard I've designed um, on the, well, it's using some free data on the San Francisco bike share uh, to kind of illustrate my points. Cool. So creating dashboards is very easy, even in operational reporting in Salesforce, but also in Einstein Analytics. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're any, you know, they're meaningful. Um, I know you're developers, most of you, but I'm sure you've all opened up a dashboard, right? 
And how many of you, when you open up this dashboard, have an experience where you actually didn't know what you're looking at? Yeah? I mean, me too, at least. I've, I've seen a lot. And um, I kind of have to go into the, to the nitty gritty and understand what I'm seeing. But um, some of the questions I often have is, you know, am I looking at a dashboard uh, with pipeline for the next three months or is it for the quarter? Are my cases open? Are they closed? Um, and if you have to, you know, ask those questions, if you're not sure, the likelihood is your dashboard is not actually being used for anything. Um, so I try to use five guidelines when I design my dashboards um, that I'll go through now. So the first one is choose your audience and know your audience. Once you know your audience, it's going to be easy to understand what kind of information you need to add to your uh, dashboards. Um, for instance, if you're thinking about a top management dashboard, you probably want to have an overview of the performance, where if you're looking at a dashboard for your sales reps, you want to have, you know, they're more interested in, in their individual performance and how they're doing. So if we're looking at my dashboard here, uh, my intention was to do it for the um, San Francisco uh, planning department, the employees there. And I want to give an overview of how the uses of the different bikes are and how the weather is influencing that. So um, the second principle is to make sure that your dashboard is readable at first glance. And so what I try to do is make sure that you describe everything that you're seeing and also try to group data into um, different categories. So if you're looking here, I actually have split my data up. So I have, it's very clear that you're looking at a, a overview dashboard containing information on your trip and also on um, the weather. Um, so also within each of my, my widgets here, um, I try to make sure that I name them. And if you had any predefined criteria, let's see we're looking at maybe a planned trip versus completed trips. You want to make sure that you put that into your dashboard. You don't want to make assumptions that people know what they're looking at. The other thing is even my, within my numbers, um, I have included um, an indication of what you're looking at. So for instance, with my average duration, it could have been in hours, it could have been in you know, minutes and seconds, but here I'm actually specifying directly what you're looking at, so I'm not causing any confusion for the end user. One of the things that I always ask myself when I design these dashboards, it's very simple advice, but I always go back and, and, and ask, uh, would my grandma understand what she's looking at? Because um, if she does, I've done a great job. If she doesn't, I probably have to go back and, and, and you know, make some changes. And I think it works in, in any scenario when you're talking about user interface. So the second principle is, um, <coughs> know what is important on your dashboard. So, um, and then you need to afterwards guide your users to it. So for instance, um, if you look at a dashboard, naturally you will start looking at the graphs first. And that's you know, the key import or a key point on your dashboard, right? So that's okay. But if everything is popping, it's gonna be hard for the eye to focus on you know, everything at once, and you kind of get a little bit confused. So um, what I do is um, I make sure that my uh, I play with some containers, I play with text, um, size, and color. Um, and one of the things that you can see here is that whenever I have my main headings, I've actually made them in a bigger font, and I've also made uh, them a little bit darker. That way they're you know, leading to the eye first. Uh, but then all the supporting text that I have to my numbers and to my widgets, I you know, make the text smaller and I also make them a little bit lighter in the color. Um, I also try to guide, even within each of the widgets, I'm, I'm trying to guide what is actually belonging together um, with, the, with the use of lines. Um, the fourth one is to make sure that you use some relevant graphs. So there's a lot of different options within Einstein Analytics um, and with every release there's even more. So have a look at whatever works for, you, for the data store you're, you're telling. So if you're looking here at my popular hours of the day, I could have chosen to use a, a pie chart, but if I did that, I have 24 values and it's gonna be hard to actually see what is what and compare uh, from each time slot to another. So instead I've chosen a bar graph um, and that allows the user to, to 
you know, easily see what is the, the peak hours of the day. Um, Last question. Yes. I remember with old Salesforce dashboards, there used to be some advice around <coughs> vertical versus horizontal charts and how the eye sees things. <coughs> Have you got any recommendations around that? Again, I think it comes down to how much data. If it's, if it's, a, if, if it's only a few, I tend to do the vertical one. But if it's a lot of values, I, I, no. Yeah, I do the horizontal. Sorry, I'm just switching around. Yeah. So that would be something that I would consider. Um, here, also in terms of space, and, and it's just easier to compare. This is also how you're used to seeing it. So, yes. And I did not switch, just see where I was. Um, final one is to make sure that your dashboard is consistent. So when you start playing with this, you're probably going to change the design a little bit. Um, but try to make it the same every time. So if you have your date selections up in the top right corner, then keep them there. If you always have something key metric um, uh, on the left side, then keep them there as well. Um, the reason I'm saying this is we're all kind of creatures ha of habit. So when we start getting used to something, we just kind of do it out of, we don't even think about it. Um, so a good example is, think about when lightning was introduced. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that got really confused. Um, that's kind of the same feeling that we're triggering within uh, users when we're trying to change the design. Okay, so Einstein Analytics is quite powerful when it comes to, to um, data um, and exploring your data. You can slice and dice it on the spot. Um, and if we, we already talked about how um, we, should, we should know our audience, we should know who we're actually talking the dashboard to. That also means that we know what questions they're going to ask. And if we know that, why not accommodate for that within our dashboard uh, using different filters and selection options? So within my dashboard here, uh, I've anticipated several things. The first thing I have is that my end users, they want to be able to see the dashboard within uh, different time frames. So in operational reporting, I could have created you know, one for this month, last month, um, and so forth. That would take up a lot of space. But here, instead, I've decided to just introduce uh, different selection options up in the top right corner. And that way, the end user can choose specifically if they want to look at this month, last month, and you're saving space on your dashboard, but it's also becoming more flexible. They can choose for a specific uh, time frame where there was an event in the city or something like that that is going to maybe have an impact. The um, other thing I anticipated is that my end users want to see um, how the trips was affected by the different type, trip types. So was it uh, by um, one-off uh, trips, so casual trips, or was it annual subscriptions they were doing? And how did that actually affect my data? So the way I've done that is I've int introduced a toggle option. And you can just select one of them, and data switches on the fly. <coughs> or you cannot choose any of it, and then it will also um, give you information. So that's up to the end user. And again, another thing I've uh, introduced is another toggle. Um, this time, I'm interested in, or I know my <coughs> users want to look at um, the most used and the least used station, uh, stations, start, both start and end stations. So I could, in, again, introduce four different graphs. But instead, I've taken two. And I introduced a toggle for each one of them. So you can swip, switch between the uh, most used and the least used. A fourth anticipation is um, when you start working with your dashboard, you probably <coughs> also want to trigger something within Salesforce. So why not introduce um, actions? So you can actually enable this, and that uh, allows, so when you're exploring your data, you find out, oh, I actually want to create a task. Or um, I just want to see this specific record. What's going on here? You can enable actions, and you, are, you then have direct um, access into Salesforce. So you don't actually have to go in and search for it there. So that's really cool. Um, all this is basically enabling the end user to make powerful decisions and kind of look for their own answers. And they don't come back to you and say, oh, now I need to this. And what about last month and so forth? So um, it's giving them a lot, a lot of power and also enabling them to make bit better decisions. Yes? Can you customize those actions yet? Um, is it just a master set you pick from? I think you can create uh, your own. And then also you have the option of doing bulk actions where you can do some um, 
very fancy stuff. I'm, that's not me, but um, some apex and visual force. I'm not sure if lightning components is part of that, but then that would pop up. But then you can uh, do it on, on bulk uh, yeah. items yeah, as well. It didn't. The bulk action stuff that gives you the option to select visual force and pages and Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to be honest, when I look from when I started two and a half years ago till now, the training I received back then, I'm not using any of it. The platform has really changed, um, and every release you're seeing some major changes as well, uh, especially since last, well, summer a year ago. Um, so. Well. Okay. You sometimes do, but you can get a lot of help, which I'm going to show you um, in a bit as well. So yeah, um, just remember when you start using these. Okay, something disappeared here. Oh well. Um, just remember when you start using these that um, you indicate where these selections apply. So is it for the whole dashboard or is it for um, just a section of the dashboard. So for the whole dashboard, I did it with the, the date selections. And for the section, I did it for the trip type. Or is it just for a specific graph, which I did for the, um, um, the end or most used and least used uh, stations. <coughs> and also, this is a key learning for myself as well. When you start using this, you get really excited and you put more and more on. And the end result is just uh, people just get more confused. So just choose carefully what actions you're putting on um, and don't make it too confusing for them. So once you get started on all this, um, you probably get asked, so how do I do, for instance, a percentage change uh, month by month? Or how do I see year to date versus year to date last year? Um, some stuff that you know was a little bit difficult to do in court. Uh, in, in standard reporting, uh, if even possible. Here, uh, we can do it on the fly. And we can use uh, compare tables to that. So I am going to sit down, because uh, it's a little bit of effort. And then, let's see here. Um, hopefully, we can get the demo up. So I have my uh, sample dashboard here. And the first thing I want to do is I want to sh show you how do we actually create a um, graph that's going to show me what is the month by on month change, percentage change. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go over here and I want to create my, my a new step. So I click on the blue button and the first thing or the next thing I have to do is choose my data set. So I'm going to choose my trips January 18 and now I'm in the, um, the step builder so to say. The first thing I want to do in here is I want to switch to compare, compare table. So over here on the, um, uh, the right, uh, there is table mode. If I click that, I have the option to choose a compare table here. The next thing I want to do is I just want to group by uh, year month. So I'm going to choose my uh, date and I'm going to choose year month here. So now we have uh, our grouping and we see how many trips do we actually have per uh, year month. So I want to now duplicate this row here. So I'm going to click on the error and clone column. The next thing I want to do is I want to go in and modify and start changing my column. So I'm going to go in here and another option I have other than clone column is edit, edit this column. So I'm going to do that. And the first thing I just want to rename it because A and B and count of rows doesn't really make sense. So I tend to just rename them. And I'm just going to call this number of trips. That's all I really want to care or care to do in, in this one. I do have to remember to hit apply. I'm going to do that. And then there is this uh, error where I can switch over to my B column. So now I'm in. Now I'm in the column there where I actually want to do my calculation. Um, again, from experience, just name it first because then it's going to make it a whole lot easier for you afterwards. Uh, change. So we can either build our own formula or we can choose one of the um, already created formulas. So I'm going to do the latter here. So I'm going to choose period over period. 
So it's going to come with some uh, predefined values. I'm just going to stick with this, but I could change it from percentage change to unit change. But again, I'm just going to keep it. Um, I'm going to hit apply. And now you can see that it has changed here. So the next thing, um, I just want to close this down. But I do have my trips. I don't really need that for anything. I'm just interested in my percentage month on month. So, whoops, that was the wrong one. So if I click here in my error, I can go in and I can hide. Best practice, just rename this. So I'm just going to call it uh, month on month and then click done. So now we can see I'll have my step in here. If I drag it over, I have my calculation. That's pretty easy. Now, it doesn't really look that nice, right? It's just a table. Um, I can take the same one and I can drag it into a chart widget and it just, you know, uses the same information but portrays it a little bit more pleasing. So that's how you use compare tables to do a simple calculation. Um, the next thing I just want to show you is how can we then do uh, year to date versus year to date last year. So this is where I'm lying a little bit with no code because we are going to look at some code but we're not actually going to um, change too much. We're not going to build it from scratch. We're using the engine to do it, the hard work for us and then we can modify it. So just as before, and just a quick, I'm just going to save. This is my habit. So save. <laughs> just as before, I'm going to click on create step and I'm going to choose my data set and I'm in the same area. So just as before again, I'm going to choose a compare table and that's it. So I want to now go in and make sure I have um, two rows. So I want to have my first my year to year or year to date. And then I also want to have my year to date last year. So I'm going to click on the plus, count, and row. So it's kind of the same thing as before. I could have chosen to clone it as well. So now go in and add a filter. I'm going to choose year to date instead of having absolute a date range, I'm going to choose relative to now. And I'm going to change it to days. I'm just going to go back to seven days before and then to now and add. For the next one, I'm going to do a filter as well. And I'm going to switch to relative to now as well. I'm just going to keep years. I'm going to drag it to last year and then add. So now we have our filters applied here. Now if I switch to SACO mode here, which is the code language they use in Einstein Analytics, I get actually the whole logic behind. Now what I can go in and do is instead of modifying everything, I'm going to say, well, seven, seven days ago, I want to delete that. And instead, I want to have current year. can spell. So now I have current year to current day. And in the second line, I'm going to do the same. So I'm going to have one year ago, but instead of two to one year ago, I'm going to delete that. And then I'm going to have current day minus one year. The second thing, we have A and B. It doesn't really look that nice. So I can go in here and rename it. So I'm going to say year to date. And then year to date last year. And I'm just going to rename my step while I remember it. So, and then I can run my query. There we go. Now you can see it's actually done my calculation down here. Um, let's see. I'm trying to. That doesn't work, so let's do that one. Yeah. I just have to zoom out a little bit because my, my uh, done button has uh, disappeared. <laughs> so it's here. I hope it all works. Um, so I can go back here and I can change it to SACO mode to actually choose a graph instead. 
Um, and now you can see I have a two on two axis or two different graphs. So I actually want to combine it. So quickly, I can go in and modify it by the properties and say bar chart, single axis. And there we go. I'm going to click done. Now it's here. So I just prepared down here that I can pull that in. And you can see it's looking a little bit weird. That's actually because I have a filter up here. But if I want to say it shouldn't, it shouldn't depend on the filters that we define otherwhere in the dashboard, I can go into the step section, click a check checkbox, boom, done, preview. And that's it. So that's basically quite easy to go in and create some different calculations within Einstein Analytics. So what we've looked at today in terms of, you know, um, creating some genius dashboards, the first thing we talked about was know your audience. And the second thing was making sure that your dashboard is easy to understand. Then we talked about guiding the data story and use the relevant visualization that fits that story. Make sure that your dashboard is consistent. And then anticipate the questions that you're going to ask or that will be asked. And then make sure you design accordingly. accordingly. Um, use the different options, the different selector, selections and filters and actions to empower the end user. And then use compare tables. They're great. If you want to learn more, go to uh, Trailhead. Um, there's also a lot of how-tos on my own blog. There's, um, I was going to create like just on the insights that I've given today. I haven't created that page yet, so you'll have to get that later. But all of it is to be find, found in there. Um, yeah, questions? Yeah. So you work for Make Positive, which mm -hmm. is a consulting partner, which yeah. kind of gives you some uh, unique opportunities. So within your design, you, you know, you talk very much about, you know, making it intuitive, making it clear and clarity. Do you work hand in hand with a, a UX specialist within your practice for that? Or is it kind of development and, you know, very much sort of uh, analytics dashboard <laughs> Um We do have a UX team, but to be honest, you can't, you, you can modify colors, so you can get advice on that. You can modify text size, but you can't change the font. You can't really um, change the widgets either. So there are some limitations within the platform. I know they're working on some of that. Um, so I will say most of it is common sense. Personally, I, I, you know, I have a degree in communication and marketing, so I kind of use those general communication theories uh, to make sure that your dashboard is, is easy to understand. I don't necessarily think you um, need to be a UX designer. The best thing you can always do is design something and then give it to your coworker and ask, do you know what you're look, uh, looking at in just you know, a couple of seconds? Uh, if they don't, then you have to go back and modify. Um, actually, with the, uh, the, the reason I'm using the, the year, month, um, day selection uh, with list instead of the date selector. It's because I had I was working with a customer where they got completely confused with using the this Einstein Analytics um, date selection. So I just started using it in a different way because it was more intuitive and, and user friendly. So you kind of learn that as you go as well. Can you still get into the day cycle for everything? Can you get to a page which will give you everything? Um, the cycle or the JSON. Jason. Yeah, so you can always do uh, Command E. Um, it's in the fingers. <laughs> so you can go in and you can do that. But I, to be honest, there are more and more where you don't really need it anymore. Uh, there are a few things, which is, for instance, limit, but that's being fixed in Spring 18 anyway. Um, so yeah, you can do it, but it's more in the UI now, to be honest, like what we did. You seem to be dragging everything into a set template there. When I used Wave, what, three years ago, Brown Belt Trade. So is that forced? Can you change what those templates are, filters away at the top? And is, it, is it all structured now, or can you still be funky and do things differently? You can do things differently. I just saved myself some time in the demo um, and pre-built some stuff. Uh, you can go in and modify the different properties as well. 
as I said, not everything is possible, like changing the colors of the graphs is not always possible. It depends on the graph that you're choosing. So there are some limitations still, but definitely it has come a long way from the brown belt training two and a half years ago. You would go to a client, you'd set those templates up, say, we're going to do it all this way, agree that at the start, so you've got consistency across your dashboards here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But when we, like, I think we might have even been in the same, in the same course. course. <laughs> like, you could yeah. drag and drop it anywhere. Like, yeah. now you can't, it's all grid. They have to be a certain Oh, yeah, yeah, that it's has changed, yeah, that's right. You can't put a background in it anymore. What? No, no, so people were doing some very creative <laughs> imagery. <laughs> and hacks. It. And what, but they, there would be a UX person involved in that, yeah. and they would design, like, a backdrop, which yeah. would lead people through mm. a story. So, in the originally, I saw some very beautiful mm. dashboards. You can't, <coughs> as far as I'm aware, you can't put any background images. Well, in you, can, you can put... You can put some things in, um, and I think, brand. yeah, I believe you can. Yeah. Okay. But I think if you look, the best example to, to actually look at really cool um, dashboards is if you download the um, learning app from App Exchange, which is a Salesforce product, and it teaches you how to do bindings and which graphs to use for different things. It's actually really cool, yep. but it's a dashboard. And it doesn't look like a dashboard. I don't know, Nick, if you would agree. You saw it as yeah, well. I, mean, that's the thing. I think the, the aim of some of this stuff is really to try and get people away from thinking of them as dashboards yeah. and thinking of them more as standalone apps. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a way into your Salesforce data, but also a way to do other tasks and stuff as well. And, you can, and because you don't just necessarily have a view of your own data in CRM, you can feed your external data set and stuff in there as well. You can join data set. Together, you can do all kinds of so, so they can be a lot richer than just a mm. yeah. operational standard. Because the last time I used it was when they'd moved the grid, mm. and then you couldn't have do all the background. So, in right. some ways, it made a significant step forward in usability, yeah. but a back step in terms of making it stick. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. the thing. But yeah, I think there is there is support for background images and stuff. Now. Yeah, I, thing. And the yeah, only you thing are still a bit, you're still kind of a well, you're tied, tied down to fonts and you're tied down to languages as well. There's no, like, there isn't language support and stuff yet. Have they sorted out currency? Currency? Mm. Mm. There's no, they haven't sorted Language currency. either. No, it's no, it's a big, language. it's a big on the, okay. you know, the idea, yeah. but it hasn't been fixed. So a lot of currency eventually. <laughs> but, but you can put pictures in and backgrounds. The only thing I'm a little bit in doubt of is that, um, when you do that, can you put, because you can't put containers on top of containers, the containers so there's some, really annoying. Yeah. yeah, which you could do in the old one, and you can't do that, but there's yeah. still the background option. Um, I just think you have to set it on the dashboard itself and not on the container, cool. so th that's the thing. Thank you. Yeah. Just to make sure I'm not monopolizing it. Um, so this one's a bit more of a, a specific one. I, I haven't explored the analytics product yet, um, but within the sort of traditional on-platform classic dashboarding. Um, so one of the in the core? Yeah, like yeah. the real sort of old school stuff. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> no lighting, nothing, nothing complex. So this is, this is kind of what I'm lumbered with at the moment. One of the biggest challenges we have at the moment is that on a dashboard, you can say, view dashboard as this person. When they click through to the reports, it doesn't let them do that. It reverts back to running in the context of the current logged in user. Are there similar sort of capabilities with analytics of well, changing that user context? It, it works a little bit differently because the, the classic reporting, it takes you from a dashboard to a report. You don't really have the concepts of reports in Einstein Analytics, so it doesn't actually take you to, to that. But you have the option of um, using some Sockle st steps. Now it's getting a bit more advanced, but you can do some circle steps to look at who is the uh, user that is locked in, and then you can bind that down to um, a step. So you can bind it into a filter, for instance, so it pre-defaults to that. Um, and then when you change the dashboard, uh, when you have the link to go to another dashboard or to um, yeah, a lens or whatever you want, um, then you can keep the, f the settings that you have already. So you can do it that way, but it works a little bit differently. But there is a data security model, but it's different to the way Salesforce works. Yeah. But you don't you don't expose the grain level data. Oh. It's not the right. same thing. You're working at a high level, and then it's okay if people know everyone at a certain postcode. So they don't know the names of those people. They just know how many people are in uh, mm. Bromley or how many people are in uh, Southwest London. Mm. 
but it comes back to how you design your, your data set because if you do have a you know personal data in your data set yes you will be able to see it unless you set the security predicate um, but that's on a row level and not on a column level so you have to be aware of that There are different ways of doing it depending on what your goal is and also the amount of data. Um, there's a lot of things you, you need to consider. Um, so, yeah. But if you are more interested in like that sort of stuff, um, a good thing I can recommend for people who generally want to learn um, Einstein Analytics is if you get the developer org that has it and you install the sales and service app, so there was a like, standard template dashboard that Salesforce has built. It's actually some quite heavy, both SACL and, um, and security predicate and role flattening and all these things going on in the dashboard itself, but also the data flow that's bringing in the data. Yeah? Oh. There were just a couple of points from the conversation before. Yeah. Someone from Salesforce that had created an Apex code that um, oh, essentially cool. took, um, so we implemented it on, a, um, on an internal project when I was working with Deloitte. Um, essentially, from the object, it, it creates a column, it creates a data set within Einstein um, of, uh, say, amount in every currency uh, that you have in your org, and then uh, essentially just created a static step of all the currencies and then manually bound it to each one to switch between. Okay. So there are ways of doing it. But a little bit of a... <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I've seen done as well in, in that regard, so which is not so heavy on the code, but is make sure you have the currency value in the data set, um, and then you can do a list selection or a toggle selection, depending on how many you have, um, and then just make sure that one has to be required. So you have to require one selection, and that way you at least you make sure that the aggregation is not wrong. Thank you.